Hey, what's up? I was just going over some object-oriented stuff, and I thought I'd go ahead and make an attempt at sort of a summation of what I think object-oriented programming is in the pure sense, according to most specifically gravitating towards Ellen Kay, who's basically the person who coined the term object-oriented programming as far as history knows and he himself so for the most part I go by his definition but the definitions he has which are sort of plural because they were evolving in little chunks at a time he would sort of focus on certain conceptual chunks for like a few years and then once he wrapped his mind around that he would go back and study Lisp and these other older programming languages and then he'd take some time and sort of like come up you know make these concepts more concrete so to speak later on and everything and that's sort of how this one way this object oriented paradigms evolved just like with functional programming it can mean different people different things to different people or different things different paradigms through different implementations even there's different ways to do functional programming and stuff um, that's all I'll say about that. I'm not a functional programming expert by any stretch, but I consider myself to be an object oriented purist and I stand on the shoulders of, I don't want to say giants, but kind of like very tall people, I guess, but not necessarily in true statue of stature, of course, but what I mean, it's such a trip because like all these people have like come up with these really basic ideas and then less basic ideas and stuff around what object oriented programming is. And I feel like the somebody who's just like, whoa, I'm just listening to all the stuff they're saying. I'm not having like much original thought myself, but I feel like I'm, I can go and like pit, like if somebody makes a coat and they're like, all we're trying to do is pit this coat on this person and button it up and just have this person warm with this coat on, right? I feel like all I'm having to do is just snap the buttons. That's the only part of like this whole big job of fabricating this coat, designing this coat, you know, all this stuff to do with them. And it's like, well, all you guys got to do is like snap the buttons together, you know? And I'm not trying to say like I'm anybody or anything in that regard, but I just, I feel like sometimes if you're just outside of the thick of it and you have a strong interest in something, you know, you can, you're sort of like observing and trying to conceptualize and put the pieces together for yourself, right? And I feel like with object oriented programming, because of my experiences and lack of, that I have a certain perspective that I, I really feel like I'm, coming to some conclusions about this over the past couple few years and so that being said I thought you know what I was just reading some stuff I was just brushing up like you can see I have a bunch of Wikipedia tabs open and stuff that I'll do from time to time I'm sure a lot of people do and just reading about different people's ideas on different things that happen to have like the words object oriented in them like this, for example, is the uh, object-oriented user interface, which isn't even necessarily related directly to object-oriented programming, but it has a lot of overlap, arguably, and stuff. And just stuff like that, you know? And I don't even really care about object-oriented interfaces per se. Like, I don't want to go study some IBM stuff. I probably will, and I, you know, from an engineering perspective, I like to be really complete. But all that being said, what I want to do is just have uh, as brief as possible discussion going over a couple Stack Overflow articles and touching on a couple other pages that have some relevant information about what is object-oriented programming because to this day, believe it or not, the vast majority of people don't know what object-oriented programming is or they have some idea um, but it's, you know, barely halfway there. It's, and it's not, I'm not trying to say like, oh, everybody's wrong and they're dumb or anything like that. I'm just saying that, and I'm one of them. I don't think I have a complete understanding of it. I, you know, it's just sort of this ideal that we're all trying to sort of mold and manipulate to, 
become something that is like a useful abstraction that has a concrete implementation, right? And then following that up with good design practices, simple design practices. That's ultimately what it is because object-oriented programming, really one of the first concepts that ever materialized and helped trigger LNK to kick off his whole thing with it, which was somebody who really got the idea of snowballing and really identified him more. Um, that was abstract data types, ADTs. And what an abstract data type is, you can go read the Wikipedia page on it if you want. That's something I say, don't over concern yourself with stuff like technicalities, really. Um, most things can be explained in a very few sentences as far as, for the most part, what you need to know about them, you know? So an abstract data type doesn't necessarily justify like a whole Wikipedia page. It's cool that there is that whole page there because there's histories behind it and you know, whatever with a lot of Wikipedia or encyclopedia type of definitions on stuff, which are definitely handy because not everybody necessarily wants like just an encyclopedia dictionary answer maybe, but that's what I'm going for. And that's what I'm trying to sort of extract out of these things I'm about to show you because I feel that that's to go any if you can just sort of cherry pick those few sentences that really sort of nail it then from there you can go and like continue down the right path more or less on the way I feel and I think a lot of other people feel about you know even L and K ideally I'm trying to kind of stick with their principles and I'm trying to kind of add my own thing to it you know just like that whole academic rhetorical conversation aspect of things so I'll go ahead and start moving along here with this so this was the article that kind of just triggered me tonight to uh, go ahead and go okay maybe I'll like jump down this rabbit hole so this is that like I said the object oriented user interface thing no big deal nothing specific about this page I was just reading some stuff that Larry Tesler who left Xerox Park in 1980 to join Apple underlined the relationship between OO or object oriented programming, I guess, and uh, like object oriented user interface. And this is a quote, supposedly. So many observers have hypothesized the small talk user interface and the small talk language are separable innovations. Consequently, most systems influenced by the small talk user interface have been engineered without resorting to small talks implementation approach. At Apple, after using Pascal, to implement six initial applications for Lisa, we discovered compelling reasons to change our programming language to incorporate more ideas from Smalltalk, which was, if, in case you don't know, it was a very early uh, object-oriented programming languages developed across the 70s and then 1980, Smalltalk 80 was, uh, that specification was like released and a bunch of stuff in Byte magazine and everything. Go look that up. I, I'm not, I wouldn't say like really maybe not spend a whole lot of time on the language itself. If you want to, there's a more uh, second gen implementation of it called Squeak that's open source and everything. LNK says use that system to make itself obsolete. So if that should tell you enough speaking in small sentences like that, it's not something to hang on every little detail and think like this is the epitome of object oriented programming or anything. It was at the time in some regards, you know, it was that, but it, it's supposed to be an evolving thing, you know, like just how he was thinking it out in conceptual chunks, then not too far behind that came these uh, chunks of implementations like that. And that's kind of what he considered small talk to be. There was a language called self in the early to mid 90s i mean it's still around but that was like it's coming of age and that was a language that had a strong influence on javascript prototypal inheritance and stuff like that which might gross you out but i mean maybe you know things could always be done better but that system that's one of the things javascript is one of the best most purest object oriented languages there are just know that and I'm not talking about the modern ES6 JavaScript I mean yeah that one's still whatever but you can go back to like turn of the century JavaScript and 
for the most part that it, even the first JavaScript and Python, um, as far as like a dynamically typed language and it, it's got some things that are nice that are very, uh, leaning more pure object oriented programming, but that language is just sort of like Swiss army knife. So it's like, uh, you know that it's like the little scissors that pop out on the Swiss army knife. It's like, that's what it is to object oriented programming in my opinion it's like yeah those scissors are handy you can cut a lot of, you probably cut most things that you need to grab a pair of scissors at random and cut with right but i just i don't think that's the epitome of a pair of like scissors or i don't know i just for lack of a better term and then there's language uh ruby is another one that's really leaning pure out of the pop general languages that's python javascript and ruby uh, I can't really think of any others off the top of my head. You know, Java, C++, those are, you know, PHP. Those, maybe PHP, I don't know. They're just, they're not. They're leaning kind of half-baked for object-oriented programming. They've, they've got to be, like, more dynamic. And don't necessarily confuse when I say a dynamic language with uh, so-called dynamic programming that's a little bit more of like a mathematical specific thing supposedly I don't know a whole lot about that but whenever I talk about dynamic I'm talking about late binding dynamic types that type of a thing as opposed to like if you're thinking like const final that's not dynamic right if you're thinking int things like that uh, you know float double those that's all not dynamic um, in my in where I'm coming from, how I'm using the term, right? It, that's all arguable in different contexts and stuff. So anyway, those are the languages to to kind of think of the way that they do it because they might seem, you know, I thought they were toy languages for the longest time, all of them. You know, that was script kitty stuff in my opinion. When I was a script kitty, I learned JavaScript in its early form before like ES3, pre ES ES3. And, uh, you know, basically ES1, ES2, whatever you want to call it. And I was like, okay, you know, I learned this, had enough of it. And then the 2000s hit, and that was right when ES3 had come out. But there was so much stuff over that first decade of the 2000s that gave JavaScript a bad, far worse rap than it deserved. Um and it wasn't necessarily the language itself like yeah there were things in the language and it was different because it was so progressive of an object oriented language that it was hard for people to wrap their head around and certain things like scoping of this keyword and you know variable hoisting whatever all that kind of stuff threw people for a loop but if you keep it in its really simple form in like that ES3-ish form and don't try and add all that there's more than one way to do it es6 plus kind of stuff which just turns it into like a monster kind of like c plus plus where it's like python got that idiom or that uh that concept right i think it's in the zen of uh, python programming list if you uh you there's preferably should be one and only one obvious way to do something so choice is nice but it's nice to sort of funnel people to that answer instead of giving them 15 different options like oh you can create a module or you could create a class or you can you know go functional or you can do you know you're giving on one hand that's really nice to have all those options but on the other hand it's confusing and then you know there's always uh more people at least in this era that are learning a language or learning software engineering learning all that kind of stuff that don't quite know how to put all the pieces together optimally that are more likely to put them together a little bit suboptimally and more likely to mix and match when maybe they should be just sticking to one thing you know like are you gonna pit little chunks of like meat and cookies like you can you know but maybe you just want to if you're just making cookies and i'm a vegetarian so i wouldn't do that but uh maybe you're just you want to stick to like chocolate chips or persimmons or whatever you're making your cookies out of right and stay in that lane um yeah so anyway i'll just go on so lease applications are now written in the language class scale 
an extension of Pascal, which I believe became uh, maybe even Objective C or something like that, but it became like Object Pascal, I think. So an extension of Pascal featuring objects, classes, subclasses, and procedure invocation by message passing. So you're seeing basically Pascal with object-oriented programming tacked onto it to some degree, right? So here's the, the things they say, like the pillars of object-oriented programming. And a lot of times you'll hear, I'm not even going to look up the Wikipedia page for it, but it says like, I just imagine it says like, oh, polymorphism, polymorphism uh, inheritance, and uh, whatever. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous in my opinion. I'll look it up, whatever. No, I'm not going to. I said I wasn't. I'm not going to go there. All right, fine. Do it in Firefox. Uh, what is it called? Object oriented. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing or whatever. I'm just going to try and go to find these pillars. Let me see if I actually... Sorry, I'm not good at multitasking when I'm trying to narrate something and think about it, like getting off track a little bit. So I'll type in pillars and see if it has that. It doesn't, of course. So just bear with me one second, please, while I find this. While I find this. I don't know if I said why I find this. While I find this. Okay. Shared objects and classes, features, encapsulation. So I guess we could even just go off this list, right? So it's like uh, objects and classes are a pillar. Um, that's just a comparison. Dynamic dispatch, message passing, encapsulation. That's definitely often cited as a pillar where you're hiding the data behind like a method. I think if I have all that right. And composition, inheritance, and delegation. So that's being able to reuse code in a nutshell. And delegation, yeah, okay. And polymorphism, that's kind of debatable. That means there's more than one way to do it. A lot of times that falls into the niche of like a polymorphic interface that's based on types. Um, I haven't really prepared a good argument for that right now, but I, I know I have one that is just, I'm already, my focus is somewhere else right now, but there's other ways to do polymorphism as well. Um, a lot of other ways, basically anything you can think of that has to do with multi-forms because in languages like Python and maybe JavaScript and stuff like that, that are less, especially Python that are don't really care about types per se so much. They um, There's other ways to be polymorphic in those languages besides just offering um, different method interfaces and stuff like that. So I'll just leave it like that. So anyway, I don't think these are the pillars necessarily. I think they're important things to consider. Um, LNK doesn't think poly polymorphism is really at all. I think polymorphism just sort of ends up in there somehow, some way, in order to keep that generalization, that generalness, or whatever. Polymorphism ends up in the mix, but it's not something to like dwell on and be like, this is a pillar as much, but that's another argument for another time. Okay, so anyway, I got here just to show you my path, and I saw message passing, and that triggered me of thinking like, Oh, message passing. That's one thing Ellen K says is that if he, somebody asked him about that, which I can jump over to here. So what did Ellen K really mean by object oriented programming stack overflow? It's a question four, six, five, nine, two. And you know, you can do a quick search for that and find it. Reportedly, Ellen K is the inventor of the term object oriented. And he's often quoted as having said that what we call OO, object-oriented programming, today is not what he meant. For example, I just found this on Google, and this is a quote from Alan Kay, Oopsala97, very good speech to go watch, totally entertaining and fascinating. A lot of his stuff is. 
Uh, I made up the term object oriented and I can tell you I didn't have C++ in mind, which was just kind of funny that he said that because he, you know, C++, you could think of like Java if you don't, aren't totally familiar with C++. It's just like, I don't know. It, there's a lot you could say about that. It's especially the thing that static instead of dynamic which makes sense because it's a compiled language, especially back then, you know, everything was incremental and whatever. C++ was an excellent idea for its time. I still, you know, it's still holding its own today. Uh, you know, small talk barely was a flash in the pan in reality. Um, and C++ is still like a legitimate, you could base your whole career off of that language. Small talk, small talk's more of just like a stepping stone, right? But that being said, he didn't like he honestly didn't have C++ in mind because he had this dynamic type of programming in mind, which C++ tried to tack on to all of its other stuff of there's that quote unquote there's more than one way to do it type of idea. So this person says the poster. I vaguely remember hearing something pretty insightful about what he did mean. Something along the lines of "quote unquote" message passing. Um, do you know what he meant? Can you fill me? Can you fill in more details of what he meant and how it differs from today's common OO? Please share some references if you have any. And then, uh, Yegor right here, Bugayenko. That's funny that he that very rightfully so that he appears on here showing a couple of his blogs he's one of those guys that really helped me uh do that whole thing of like buttoning the code up i don't think he totally grasped object-oriented programming perfectly but he's i wouldn't have the grasp that i feel like i do if it wasn't for him i i go read all his stuff there's a few other very few other people that i would say go read their stuff you know take it all for a grain of salt but there's you'll get a lot of traction and a lot of progress towards the right way of doing object-oriented programming. But then all of a sudden they just take a left turn onto a dirt road and you're like, whoa, you know, like we can stay on the highway. That's what I feel like. And that's what I'm just kind of briefly trying to demonstrate here. So then you get down here and what's quoted is this uh, kind of famous email if you're sort of like me in a object-oriented pur purist kind of person you've probably heard about or read this email one or more times and this person had wrote him in uh, 2003 Stefan Ram and wrote to Ellen K and uh, regarding clarification of object oriented and so this is Ellen K's response is over here against the rail and then this little quoted is the original message from Stefan right so Ellen K says, hi, Stefan. Sorry for the delay, but I was on vacation. Stefan Ram wrote, dear Dr. K, I would like to have some authoritative word on the term object-oriented programming for my tutorial page on the subject. The only two sources I consider to be quote-unquote authoritative are the ISO, which defines object-oriented and this thing, and you, because as they say, you have coined that term. And then so Ellen K wrote back, I'm pretty sure I did. Um, and then Stefan had written, well, before we get to Stefan's next paragraph, I'll jump over this tab I have open to that ISO thing. And it's just basically this information technology vocabulary. It's freely available. Uh, there's the URL. I'll try and remember to put a link below the, in the comment below the video. And it says object oriented, you know, kind of like a dictionary definition almost for it. And that being said, I do not consider the ISO the be all end all by any means, any stretch of the imagination, but it's just a source to consider, right? So pertaining to a technique or programming language that supports objects, classes, and inheritance. Note one to entry. Some authorities list the following requirements. Some authorities, you know, so of course, they're not even necessarily authoritative. They're just sort of like citing. Um, sort of just trying to do what I'm doing and just sort of break down and sum, sum up some more authoritative sources. Following requirements for object-oriented programming information hiding or encapsulation, data abstraction, message passing, polymorphism, dynamic binding, and inheritance. And personally, I can agree with a lot of those. Like I said, you know, polymorphism, 
what the exact concrete definition, some form of polymorphism, whatever. But in general, you know, those are kind of whatevers. Note two, object-oriented term, um, object-oriented language, some examples. It's just typical, like, standard organization, kind of nothing too impressive, right? So anyway, that's just to kind of give you a picture of what that is. Now I'll jump back over to here. I'm pretty sure I did, he said. And then, unfortunately, it's difficult to find a web page or source with your definition or description of that term. There are several reports about what you might have said in this regard, like inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation. But these are not firsthand sources. I am also aware that later you put more emphasis emphasis on messaging but I still would like to know about object oriented for the records my tutorial page and further distribution and publication could you please explain when and where was the term object oriented first used so Alan Kay goes on to say at Utah sometime after November 66 when influenced by Sketchpad, Simula and design for ARPANET the Burroughs B5000 and my background in biology and mathematics I thought of an architecture for programming. It was probably in 1967 when somebody asked me what I was doing and I said, it's object-oriented programming. The original conception of it had the following parts. I thought of objects being like biological cells and or individual computers on a network. So isolated computers running their own processes, only able to communicate with messages. So messaging came at the very beginning. It took a while to see how to do messaging in a programming language efficiently enough to be useful. So that goes back to that abstract data types and messaging are the very first early things to do with object oriented programming. And that of course is central is that idea of the messaging. So that got me thinking even more about messaging of like, what, what specifically is this, you know, I think we all, probably could have some idea of what messaging is and that's what he he says too later in this article in this response well I guess I'll just go ahead and read it it's not too long I wanted to get rid of data the B5000 almost did this via its almost unbelievable hardware architecture I realized the cell slash whole computer metaphor would get rid of data and that this is the assignment operator would just be another message token it took me quite a while to think this out because I really thought of all these symbols as names for functions or procedures. So when he talks about trying to get rid of data, he's talking about that encapsulation, that abstraction, all that kind of stuff to be to where you're talking about behaviors instead of data because everything was very data centric then to a heavy degree to this day, people still rely too much on the data centric portion of it. But, and when he talks about cells too, He's, you know, if you just think of like a, like an illustration of a cell, you know, where it's just, it sort of has this membrane around it and everything. And it's sort of, it's doing what it does. And you're more concerned with the behaviors of that cell versus whether or not some little like microscopic internal aspect of it or anything like that, you know, just to put it really simply. Um, and the whole computer metaphor, which he considers like, analogous to that is we have it today now when he was first talking about it it was like pre-internet um but now that we have the internet with the restful apis and stuff representational state transfer subset of the http protocol which is basically just you know you call the web page and instead of maybe not getting a web page back a web page is one type of response but you can you're this is a message right here you know, in a nutshell, this is a message. This HTTP thing, you're we're calling another computer. We don't know what its state is back there. We don't know what operating system Wikipedia runs on necessarily. You know, we don't know any of that. We don't know what type of database this information stored in. All we know is we get the information. You know what I mean? We get the informational response back, and. I think I think ideally continuing with that whole idea is that we should even get back an object, you know, like a response object, like everything, all that, 
the idea of data should be a very last maybe I would go out on a limb and say like a last minute thing so you know this by the time it's just the very end result we see these words we see this data on the screen and we didn't know for sure until that very last minute maybe that we were going to even get this data on the screen it might have been like an error you know 500 server error or something like that or 400 not found error or whatever you know it could be it could be anything at different times or maybe this is supposed to give us a, a picture of a flower on every even minute of the day or something or whatever type of behavior you expect this uh this entity this uh cellular system this isolated computer or whatever you want to think of it as like you know what i mean so that's why that that gives it that dynamicism you know if we're thinking oh you know what this better return us that and it better have have everything in word paragraph form or whatever um then we're stuck like that then we can't expect anything else or if we do want to expect anything else then we have to build conditions for that and all of a sudden the program gets really big and bulky right so we basically have a preference maybe for how we'd like that data to finally end up being and that's where if you think about it like the interfacing comes in because then you can say hey give me this page or give me uh you know you can take that object that return object that response object so to speak and you can say i want um whatever value as html you know and then that would be like here's this page is that right or maybe you can say i want it as a streaming movie whatever you know who knows it's just like when you start thinking more dynamic like that and that is where extensibility comes in because even if it doesn't offer a streaming movie about representational uh representational state transfer like in this particular instance for this message right here and really this uh, for me to say message i'm using that very loosely right now because like where's the parameters to the message you know what i mean this is more like just the address arguably um there's more data going on behind the scenes you know what i mean it's it's hitting port 80 or port 443 because it happens to be https probably so there's there's other details to that message behind the scenes that are going on all we're visibly seeing with this particular interface is this address but anyway don't think into that too much just sort of like just kind of take in whatever you feel like taking in off of that very lightly it you know maybe that's making some sense so uh rest if you think of like those json apis maybe even xml apis whatever but especially json's a really good uh easy to understand i think for a lot of people example of like a json web api where you're literally you can call that a lot like an internal function on your own program right so that in one regard is message passing and that's a message passing that does go out to a complete other computer system but what i'm going to try and maybe demonstrate a little bit is that even in a language like python java whatever when you just do a method call which i should maybe jump over to this one so what is the difference between message passing and meth method invocation because that's what a lot of people if you like think about it, it's like okay well a message in object oriented programming by a lot of definitions is just calling a method you know but then it's like well where do you draw the line you know what i mean like are they synonymous or is there more or less to it or you know maybe is that a completely wrong idea so is there a definition between message passing and method invocation or can they be considered equivalent this is probably specific to the language many languages don't support message passing though all the ones i can think of support methods and the ones that do can have entirely different implementations also there are big differences in method invocation depending on the language c versus java versus lisp versus your favorite language i believe this is language agnostic can you do with a past method what you can't do with an invoked method and vice versa in your favorite language and then just like the person says do you mean uh what can you do with a past message that you can't do so that's what i think they meant was like basically what's what's the difference between uh 
a message and a method or whatever if there is one and so if we scroll down here i think this page right here is definitely uh questions three five six two two seven two um what's the difference between message passing and method invocation this one is so interesting in my opinion i don't know i'm a dork but i think this every word every answer even though they might seem conflicting they're all relevant it's a great page <laughs> i i think it's like i wanted to print it off as a pdf and just save it because at first approximation the answer is none as long as you quote unquote behave normally whatever they mean by that even though many people think there is technically it is usually the same a cached lookup of a piece of code to be executed for a particular named operation at least for the normal case calling the name of the operation a message or a virtual method does not make a difference but the actor language is really different in having active objects every object has an implicit message queue and a worker thread at least conceptually parallel processing becomes easier to handle google also communicating sequentially processes for more but in small talk it's possible to wrap objects to make them actor like without actually changing the compiler the syntax or even recompiling don't freak out by this language if this doesn't make sense to you congratulations you're part of the vast majority of the world i would think um you know maybe little pieces of it kind of do who cares it doesn't matter like <laughs> this Object-oriented programming is not meant to be this complicated, right? Is terminology-wise or any of that. This is just people throwing a lot of stuff at the wall to see kind of what can stick and what other people think about it. So this is one perspective on it. And it's this message queue is a major takeaway here. And if you're familiar with Windows, Microsoft Windows programming especially, uh, I... <sighs> I've never done X11 Windows programming that I can remember. Um, I mean, if I did, it was using a library like GTK or something. But, and if I did, it was like decades ago. But anyway, um, so I, I can only really speak from, I have a lot more experience with Windows API, Microsoft Windows API programming. So you have a message queue in there, right? And that's a thing where basically you it's an event-based queue you know there's a lot of paradigms and stuff that that go off of that style of thing but i think windows really from my perspective my experience really nailed that early on and a lot of people try and say oh windows you know you you uh declare like a windows class and all this stuff and define you know fill in the data structure for a windows class and don't think that this is like an object or you know you're going to get back an object or whatever but this is an object oriented programming and i've always thought like that makes me upset when people say that because it is it really is it's not object oriented programming per se is like some popular languages implement it like don't think that you know if you're programming with the windows c programming language api don't think that you're going to get back like a capital o quote unquote object oriented programming the way a lot of other people think about it but in some regard it does have a lot of overlap with the object oriented programming idea so it's wrong to say like oh this has nothing to do with object oriented programming you know it's just like when people well not just like but a lot like when people say oh javascript and java are completely unrelated it's like actually that's not true at all they're actually very related but they also have an equal amount of differences you know so it, it's just going to only confuse people if you, I feel like if saying that, you know, these are unrelated, you know, and whatever. I remember when I took a, for the little tiny bit of college I did have, uh, I took a JavaScript class when they were first really pushing that is like the language that the ubiquitous language that's going to be everywhere. And the logo for the class was the Java steaming cup, Java logo. And then that class, I think they also, if I remember correctly, they said that those languages were unrelated. I'm like, why are you using the Java logo for a JavaScript class? <laughs> Even if with my argument that they are related, that that part isn't. But uh, anyway, the actor language is really different in having, uh, yeah, so the message queue. So what this brings up the idea of is well, mostly in the Windows regards so far in this argument, I'll say, 
so that's where windows gets the click like if i click on something then that's going to go into a message queue you know if i like right click right here that goes to a message queue and then that queue gets processed at whatever rate and then it very quickly usually gets to that message and it says hey you know we've got a right click it's over this particular area of content so we should display this particular menu go ahead and do that and in a nutshell that's kind of a common way that that message queue will work right or if I minimize this window I'm even just hovering over this this is sending a message of like the mouse location the hover and da 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 and that tells the program or maybe it passes that message off to the the windows subsystem itself and says hey you know flip the the color behind this you know invert the colors or whatever to show that it's highlighted there's all those little things that happen so that's one form of messages if you're familiar the windows management messages and stuff like that but that's not the only way that messaging can necessarily work but if you think of that message queue you can start to think of how things might be a little bit more than like your typical function call because they are related I'll say that there's a ton of overlap but the way that functions and methods and whatnot are called within a program in a particular language is more like a low-level particular implementation like almost a subset of a message um, of message passing so just like I said up here you know when you know this is the address whatever somebody goes on to say down the way that um, uh, ultimately it goes to a number you know this is going to be converted to an IP number and then your message is going to go there right you know everything gets converted to numbers and computing at some point and uh, so in that regard the same thing with a function call you know it's going to get converted to like a numeric virtual memory address and then a physical memory address and whatever and it's going to eventually go to a location and then it's going to pass like some information to that location or based on you know whatever vector it gets back returned to shoot that and deflect that information somewhere else so to speak so uh, in small talk when you try to send a message which is not understood I think they meant by the receiver ie some object foo arg uh, the message object is created containing the name and arguments and the message object is passed as an argument to the does not understand message thus an object can decide itself how to deal with unimplemented message sends aka calls of unimplemented method it can of course push them into a queue for a worker process to sequentialize them so i don't know a hundred percent what they mean and maybe they misworded some stuff whatever but i'm going to give my spin to it um i and this is another thing like i said with yegor stuff with all these guys stuff is that you can just sort of put your own spin on it and just think about it for a minute and you could probably come to either the conclusion they meant or the conclusion they should have meant maybe and uh, so if you think about this in a switch case statement, like in the Windows message queue, the like send message, post message, window, uh, you know, management event queue, whatever kind of stuff for your program, you have that default case at the end of that switch statement, right? Or that else case, if you happen to be using if or whatever, you know, so that when it gets there, that can handle the unimplemented message you know so instead of doing you don't necessarily have to think about function calls per se and especially like I said with early JavaScript like 1.0 one thing that's tempting to do a lot of times in there is to pass things as strings you know if you want to pass a message just pass a string and then when you get into that object over there check and see like oh did they give you this string saying that they want a green light or whatever you know so you can just literally make a string green light like hey give me green light and something like that you don't you, that abstract data type comes back into play like I said messages and abstract data types are probably if you had to have two pillars those are them and abstract data types in a nutshell in a few sentences kind of thing is 
human understandable data types. I think a good example of it is a floating point data type because that's like a decimal number more or less, right? And uh, you're thinking more about that decimal number itself for the most part, especially if it's a truly purely abstract data type, you know, like if, if you're really technical with uh, programming, you're probably thinking about like the ifs and or buts around floating points like, oh, there's, you got to be careful with this, you know, once you get up to this high and it can't accurately do something, you know, whatever, you can end up with inaccuracies and floating types and there's limits to that, right? And that's because it's not a 100% purely abstract data type, you know, these are all ideals that things are leaning to to whatever degree. So it's almost like the speed of light or absolute zero or something like that. It's like, um, in a really, in a really elementary level, you know, like supposedly there, there's things, even Ellen K in that 1997 speech, what a trippy coincidence. He talks about that things moving in cells move faster than the speed of light trip out on that. The, the parts within speaking of cells, um, you got to watch that speech. Like, if you care about anything, watch that speech. It's so cool. Oopsla97. Um, but, you know, going with a really elementary definition of speed of light, up until I learned that fact, as far as I ever thought about the speed of light, everything is approaching near the speed of light in a vacuum, right? So even light itself has impediments, absolute zero. We can't ever quite get there, at least in the last documentary or two I watched on it, that kind of stuff. So I just think of it as like, we're approaching these things. We're always trying to like, you know, approach perfection, strive for perfection, but not necessarily that anything's ever there kind of thing. Um, yeah, I kind of, sorry go off on so many random tangents I kind of forget where I was at with stuff so I'll just keep on plugging along there's enough of it will come back up that I should touch on most of the points I want to so anyway that's about what it is so instead of getting like an error like this method's not implemented JavaScript I think does that in a really good way like uh, the undefined kind of stuff where you end up with undefined and you can sort of just deal with that in certain regards maybe not perfectly but um you know, maybe not the most ideally, but that's just a loose example. Like if you go for a variable and it's undefined, then you know like, okay, I can deal with this as a condition instead of like in Java or other languages like that. You either have to make this really crufty, not very readable, technical looking syntax to kind of pull that same effect off or just not even, you know, just consider it a non, uh, feature that you don't even have, you know? That's where design patterns, by the way, too, like the book, when you hear about those books on, or people talking about just design patterns in general, a lot of times they lean towards like Java and C++. Um, that's where a lot of those quote unquote design patterns are most important. Like if you look them up and the implementations of them and stuff, but a lot of other languages, design patterns, in software are filling gaps that the programming languages have you know what i mean like they're making up for stuff that is just it's not a built-in sugary sin simple syntax you know so it's like what if you didn't have a plus operator in a language to add two integers to, or numbers whatever kind of numbers it doesn't matter for the sake of this example, then you would have to um, create like some sort of procedure and everything. You could name it legibly and readably and all that, but you'd need to create this procedure and you'd need to go in and use whatever maybe low level things of like anding or whatever type of technique you're gonna use to like add these things together and then return that result or whatever you're gonna do. So you could accomplish it, but you sort of have to go through like some procedure to do that and so in languages like java those things come up enough those mishaps in the language or those underbakings that it's like hey here's a book for these <laughs> half-baked languages that don't do all don't finish the job you know and 
so you end up with a lot of craft and everything so if you just kind of stick with those patterns and it kind of accelerates you getting there without having to reinvent the wheels excuse me and it also what they say too of course is the language that you're talking about like if you say singleton then that means you just want one object you know and preferably that that object you could the way that you ask for it it will create it anew when you ask for it if it doesn't exist and if you ask for it again then it will give you that already now existing copy you know so if i just say singleton to you and you're familiar with that design you know not necessarily that the uh concrete implementation details in whatever language but if you're at least just familiar with that concept like it's some object i just only want you know a logger i only want one instance of my logger and if i ask for logger and it's not there give me a new one and if it is there then give me the same old one don't create a hundred different loggers you know and some memory leak type of effect and all that you know so by just saying singleton to you, I can say I I implemented a singleton logger. And then if you just know enough about the, you know, the few sentence description right there, then you know, okay, I've yeah, I've implemented a logger that you can only get one instance of. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of it, it's like how do you do it? You know? And in each language, there's the generic way to do it that you can sort of do in most general purpose quote unquote object oriented programming languages that you can kind of do that but then there's the idiomatic ways like in python they call it the pythonic way right but those are the basically the the idiomatic ways of doing it and you might be able to do it in like one or a few lines instead of those blocks of crufty code so always be looking for that idiomatic way um when you see those general definitions of those things especially today there's almost always an idiomatic way or at least a way to shave a fat corner off of it and throw in some idioms an idiom or two in there but uh yeah anyway and they can vary too like if you want that singleton do you want it created sort of like globally instantly you know like statically like right away or do you want it to be created like when you ask for it? You know, I might not ask for a logger on this run. It depends. Like I only ask for a logger if this is totally arbitrary, not right, not real world. But if you start this program on an even minute, then I'll ask you for a logger. Of course, I could that in a more real world situation. I hate to use completely arbitrary things like that because then it's just like pfft, you can't even apply that at all. That would never happen, right? Maybe, but probably not. But um say that you only want to want the logger if they pass a command line that asks you know a minus l on the command line that asks for the logger or something like that you know so that type of thing so then you wouldn't want to cut out the and reserve the memory and instantiate a logging object if they didn't pass the minus l right so you could that would be late dynamic binding style like the late dynamic style of things that L and K talks about that that would fall under that umbrella um, but yeah I sort of went way off on another tangent there so that's kind of what I get out of that as far as the going all the way back to the messaging thing is that this would be like the else or the default case or whatever and also the idea of a message queue to where you know it's not a stack which somebody mentions later that a stack is more of like a sequence thing it, it can't work like asynchronously like is getting more and more popular these days which object oriented has always as far as like you know by the mid 90s once implementation started really taking off as far as I know asynchronous was always something we're supposed to consider that at any point an object oriented programming language should ideally be able to be asynchronous and with like no js we started really seeing that especially in the mainstream and it can be a beautiful thing it can be ugly if it's not handled right but it can be very beautiful if it is um okay so moving along of course is impossible statically typed languages unless you i don't know that i agree with all that well let me go down here 
and they say I'm writing about language implementations here as in Java versus Smalltalk not interprocess mechanisms and so that's how I mentioned like that if within a language itself very low level right but also the interprocess communications you could even think of that like a JSON RESTful across the web API call um, that's that would be in a process, you know, you're calling, it's another process way over on a remote machine, right? But it's still the same idea. I mean, if you, if the network's transparent and it's just automatic through, you know, if you can make a, like you can on a lot of systems, you can do an HTTP call. Like I can open up a file type of browser on my local system and I can punch in a web address in a lot of contexts and like maybe an image location or something across the web. And I can type that in, like maybe even to paint if I knew uh, an image location, right? Like, let's even see here. I'll uh, get right click and go copy, copy image address. And I'm gonna go to paint and I'm gonna go control O, control V, and then let's see if it will open it. Don't say, there it is, boom, you see that? So it's uh, it went out across the internet just like I just typed it in like it was a file name and it went and pulled that image right there straight off the internet with all that extra cruft on the image address and everything, uh, copy image address, paste. So we can see this was the address that you could just abstractly say gets converted to number numbers. And then there's two parameters, S equals 48, G equals one, whatever that means. I don't even care. It doesn't even matter right now. But that just shows you that is that. <laughs> like it wasn't until this century really that that came to be so seamless like that I feel like in the mainstream operating systems and stuff but that shows you that you can you can abstract that whole low level versus high level thing there and go do that okay I can tell I'm starting to get a little bit tired so I know other people if you've hung in there this far or two so I'm going to blast through this using objective C as an example the major difference In Java, however, method invocation is more of a static thing because you have a reference to an object of the type you're calling with the method on the method with the name, same name and type signature must exist of that type or the compiler will complain, which I've covered that. Uh, it's interesting the actual call is dynamic, although this is not obvious for the programmer. For example, consider this. So here's like one of those crufty ways of like you can, um, you know, you have this class and it's got a particular method on it, a behavior, do something, returns nothing, whatever. It's just a simple possible example, right? And you have another class and it has a method in it. And if you were to call some method in this class, it's going to create a new object of just a generic object type, right? So it's basically saying almost a featureless object for this example. And then object do something, it's gonna try and call this do something, but it didn't create that specific type of class right there. So do something in theory is missing, complains that object uh, contains no such method, right? And that would be like an error situation probably. However, through explicit cast, you can calm the compiler down even though your program will crash at runtime even though your program will ca crash at runtime, huh? Okay, uh, so they're doing the same thing here. This is like a replacement to that line. And instead of, before it calls, do something, it casts object to this. So it basically says, hey, object, um, you know, don't consider yourself this, or don't tell people you're that. Tell people you are you know, tell it that you are an instance of this, whatever. I That kind of starts to paint the picture. Um, I don't think specifically how it plays out is necessarily as important, but it's just to say there's other, maybe other ways of doing that, you know, to where you don't want to crash if do something doesn't exist. And then that whole idea of, uh, you know, instead of being that synchronous stack thing necessarily, 
the message is more of a high level thing. It can be remote or it can be that local procedure. And it can also be the queue based instead of the uh, stack based. And then right here, I don't think any of that's too crazy. Okay, right here it says, as far as I can recall, they've been formally proven to be equivalent. It doesn't take a whole lot of thinking to at least indicate that they should be. It's funny, I started reading this when I was like, oh, I, I don't even want to read this answer. I disagree with it. And then it turned out to be, you know, one that I definitely, obviously I clicked the up arrow on it. I think especially for the original post, it is probably the most relevant answer arguably at uh or at least they should be about all it takes is ignoring for a moment the direct equivalence of the call address with an actual spot in memory and consider it simply as a number which i mentioned all this stuff before too um, from this viewpoint the number is simply an abstract identifier uniquely identifies a particular type of functionality you wish to invoke even when you are invoking functions in the same machine there's no real requirement that the called address directly specify the physical or even virtual address of the called function you know so Kind of like I was demonstrating with that image, like how I just said, hey, you know, give me this file. It didn't necessarily have to be on my machine, you know. So it it ended up through this little pachinko machine ends up going out across the Internet to get it. But when it's all said and done, it looks from the user perspective, from that abstract data type perspective, from that encapsulated perspective, it seemed like it was. So uh, then they, they go into some details, like some low level examples and. Nice stuff like that. Member function call is simply a type of message passing that provides or at least facilitates an optimization under common circumstances. Uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence between the abstract service identifier and the address uh, is trivial, exceptionally fast, whatever. At the same time, make no mistake, the fact that something looks like a member function call doesn't prevent it from actually executing on another machine or asynchronously or frequently both the typical mechanism to accomplish this proxy function that translates the virtual message of a member function call into a real message for example example decom corba those were all uh more like remote procedure calls they were really bad implementations of what ultimately now is a really more lighter weight and more purely object oriented thing like the JSON RESTful API stuff, GraphQL, whatever you want to think of it as. I just use JSON as just a really simple common thing like that. And you know, these were overcomplicated, low level proprietary, so to speak, arguably kind of things. Once it was just simple, open, available to all systems that's where you end up with the json and it was beautiful and it still is okay they really aren't the same thing in practice message passing is a way to transfer data and instructions between two or more parallel processes method invocation is a way to call a subroutine um this erlang i'm not very familiar with that at all Message passing most likely invokes a form of method invocation, but method invocation doesn't necessarily invoke message passing. If it did, message passing is one form performing synchronization between two parallel processes. Method invocation generally means synchronous activities. So caller waits for the method to finish before it can continue. Message passing is a form of coroutine. Method invocation is a form of subroutine. So all subroutines are coroutines, but all coroutines are not subroutines. Message passing can also refer to the way one calls methods in languages like Smalltalk, Objective-C, and Ruby, which, you know, you could argue LNK was talking about it from that perspective on one hand, but then on the other hand, yes, these languages like to think of it as message passing, but it's a subroutine that involves pushing something onto the stack. So that's where I say it's like a subset of message passing, you know, it is message passing, but it doesn't, you know, message passing itself can mean so much more. While suspending the method calling the subroutine, the implementation is stack pass method invocating, which implies the caller is blocked while it waits uh, on the calling routine to return. Message passing has no such semantics. It does not have to wait for its routine. Invoking to finish was my point. That's the difference. So if you do want to point out a difference, I would agree that I think message passing especially when you factor in the way windows has implemented it stuff like that it does lean towards an asynchronous option but somebody i think brings it up down here oh right here bam 
Is there a difference between message passing and message invocation, or can they be considered equivalent? There are similar some differences. Messages can be passed synchronously or asynchronously. Example, the difference between send message and post message in Windows. So if you send a message, oh, I, I should know these more. I've programmed with them enough, but it's been a while since I've done enough programming with them. If I remember correctly, send message just adds it to the message queue and post message. Let me just, so it's not a big deal. You could say either one right now. Post message safely enables cross order and scripts different. Oh, that's the wrong post message. This is one we want. Um, posts a message in the queue associated with the thread that created the spiff and returns without waiting for the thread to process the message. Okay. So I guess one way to remember it easy and this is what I think. Okay, one way to remember it easy is the S maybe stands for synchronous. So if you send the message, it's going to immediately like bump you towards the front of the line and tell the procedure, hey, this message has high priority. Deal with it now. And post message is going to add it to the queue. So that's the difference there. So this is more like how a lot of uh, the languages, the low level implementation, a method call, whatnot in a programming language is going to use this style, this synchronous style, and then this is using that message, that higher level message queue style maybe. So you might send a message without knowing exactly which remote object you're sending it to. The target object might be on a remote uh, machine or OS. Okay, and then I'm going to bounce back over here and my mathematical background made me realize that each object, this is L and K again, uh, could have several algebras associated with it. I think you can just think of algebras as like abstractions, symbols, stuff like that. And there could be families of these and that these would be very, very useful. The term polymorphism was imposed much later, I think by Peter Wagner. And it is quite, isn't quite valid since it really comes from the nomenclature of functions. And I wanted quite a bit more than functions. I made up a term genericity, which I think maybe like if you think of generics, for dealing with generic behavior, well, yeah, obviously, in quasi-algebraic form. Quasi being the keyword, like I wouldn't hang on, even though he's definitely has like a math major kind of background as well. I just, it's quasi as far as we care. I didn't like the way Simula 1 or Simula 67 did inheritance, though I thought Nygaard and Dahl were just tremendous thinkers and designers. So I decided to leave out inheritance as a built-in feature until I understood it better. So that's one thing where you could argue that that's not necessarily a pillar and class inheritance like versus composition, you know, do you want to say that composition's inheritance? But a lot of the idea of inheritance has come to be like that, uh, more like static class kind of inheritance. So that's sort of a misnomer too. When people hear that, they're like, oh, that's a pillar. I need to, I need to use inheritance and do big upfront design and stupid UML modeling. <laughs> Sorry, but those are just whatever. I, you, you should be re, those should be things that come later. Like UML, if you're doing UML before you write the program, a lot of times I think that maybe even 99% of the time, I think that's the completely wrong way to do it. That's big upfront design. That's making a bunch of assumptions without doing implementation. That's not, it doesn't, that doesn't feel agile to me. Of course, you could force it to be agile, but I think it's like pitting the carriage in front of the horse. Um, what was the other thing I was thinking about? I can't remember. It just popped right out of my head like that. The inheritance with that, I would say that it, uh, you want to refactor back to inheritance. You shouldn't, if the first, if you're designing these classes and you're like, oh, you know, the, uh, the horse and the dog are both animals and they both have four legs. And so they should come from a common base class. Yeah, cool. They probably should, but just start implementing one or the other. And then when you go to implement the second one, you'll start seeing those commonalities. You don't have to guess. They'll just be there right in front of your face. And then you can just start nudging stuff to where it goes. Like, okay, 
this is common, this is common, this is common, and then pull down your specializations. You know what I mean? And that way you can just start blasting out the code and be very agile. And what if you don't, what if whatever, all you need to do is implement the dog and then the customer just decides like, you know what, we don't want animals in this program, you know, for being just random stupid examples. If you do that whole thing of like making, you know, doing this super class and having these inherited, these classes inherit from that super class and you implement the dog and the horse, look at all that upfront design. Look at all that implementation you've done that you turn around and just threw away. That's just one argument against it. You know, I could make several. So it's just, it makes so much more sense, especially from that agile, modern agile context of just do the one when you start seeing that duplication when you think of those principles you know now we're talking more imperative details of like um kiss keep it short and simple dry don't repeat yourself you know you can repeat yourself two maybe three times or whatever like don't get super crazy about like minimal repetition that's fine but as soon as you do start repeating yourself there's a little odor that that can creep up you know and what you're always trying to do that first principles kiss keep it short and simple so if going and making a super class because you wrote this one line this one single statement twice or something is it really keeping it shorter and simpler to go create this super class or is it still just you know yeah you do have two places to change it but if they're both like on the same screen you know what i mean it's like you just got to weigh out your options there and whichever's the shortest and simplest and least error prone or whatever go with that and if then once you cross that little threshold then it's like okay i'm gonna stop take a minute refactor that commit the changes whatever done okay my original experience with this architecture we're done using a model one adapted from this and that and but these were rather list like lisp like functional programming language but w which he likes a lot like he you know he was trying to take a lot of the cool concepts, not necessarily the functional per se stuff, but anyway, uh, more of conventional readable syntax. I didn't understand the monster lisp idea of tangible meta language then, but got kind of close with ideas about extensible languages draw from various sources, sources um, including irons, excuse me, IMP. So I like just the term extensible too. I don't know if this exact context he's using it in, but just how objects can be extensible, you know, especially when you do composition, favoring object composition over that quote unquote inheritance, you know, as the ideal form of inheritance. But some languages don't make that easy. That's why you end up like in Java, uh, you end up, if you try and do composition, you end, you have to type more and I, the cool thing is, is it's in front of your face then. Like if you have a super class, unless you have a big bloated or whatever, usually IDE that like uh, is doing all this, helping you all the time and pitting all these pop-ups, which I hate. I shut all that stuff off. I'd rather use Notepad personally and take the time to do API lookups. I just can't stand that interference personally. But uh, that's what you end up dealing with. Otherwise that super class is like hidden from your view. So it's a bunch of implementation details that you really should know or have easy access to for, because you're working, you know, around that implementation, but you don't know, like, do you, if you have a super class, do you need to call the constructor? Do you need to call, call the constructor before your constructor? Are there certain times when you shouldn't call that constructor? Should you pass all the arguments down or just some of it? You know, you don't know any of that until a lot of times, even with an IDE or whatever, you might have to go back and look at that constructor and read the API documentation and all that. And it's like, how is that helping you? You know what I mean? It, it, the only way it's helping you is if it's saving you from code duplication for the most part, you know, if it's simplifying if it's the lesser of two evils, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. The second phase of this was to finally understand Lisp and then understanding to make nicer and smaller and more powerful and more late bound understructures. Late bound, that's key right there. Um, Dave Fisher's thesis was done in McCarthy style and his ideas about extensible control structures were very helpful. Another big influence at this time was Carlet 
Carl Hewitt's planner, which has never gotten the recognition it deserves, given how well and how early, how earlier it was able to anticipate prologue. So this is just, he's given a lot of history. You know, you don't necessarily have to care about those languages or whatever systems they are, but if you have the time and interest, go check them out, you know. Um, their steps, just like Small Talk was. The original Small Talk at Xerox Park came out of the above. The subsequent Small Talks are, com are complained about in the end of the history chapter. They backslid towards Simula and did not replace the extension mechanisms with safer ones that were anywhere near as useful. Just technicalities. But uh, speaking of Simula, so that was more of like coming from a, the mathematician world. I guess you'd say so they that that's the abstract data types too, like that type of a thing where it's trying to make a system that's more high level and more leaning towards the user's way of thinking rather than that assembly language implementer person's way of thinking, you know, where they're worried about like, oh, an integer can only be, you know, 32K plus or minus 32k or whatever it was at that time you know like instead of worrying about those details it's like hey i got a number you know like okay i can understand that like that whole analogy to the speed of light and approaching the speed of light and never quite getting it like i understand there could be a limit on that integer but what if i want to throw a decimal out there what if i want to throw a whole number what if this another way JavaScript does it well. With JavaScript, what do you have? You have like a 64-bit number, right? And you can throw a decimal in there, you can throw a whole number, whatever. It just, it deals with it. You don't think about it. Uh, Python 3 has the built-in large number library thing, so you can just give it huge numbers, and it can deal really well with huge numbers. It just scales automatically behind the scenes. But Python's still kind of dumb in re in that regard because you have to discern between floats and ints. You know, there's a certain, those are optimizations is ultimately what it comes to, but that's where it's leaning away from the abstract data type, you know? And I don't like the fact that you, I mean, sometimes it's nice to be explicit and have that explicit control and everything, but that doesn't lend itself towards object-oriented programming necessarily, in my opinion. Um, you you should be able to just you shouldn't have to be casting integers and floats in python so that's something java got right and speaking of ruby i'm not a big fan but there are a few things that ruby did get very right in my, as far as i've seen i've never learned the whole language inside and out but uh the you know at the core on the surface is like how it automatically returns the last expression if you don't uh explicitly return a return value it will just implicitly return that. I kind of really love that. I, I think that cuts out so much stuff. So between like some of the stuff that Python preaches, not the foundation, but the, you know, specifically engineering wise, some of the stuff they preach with mostly JavaScript and the good Ruby stuff sprinkled in, somewhere right in there is where you're going to find um and then of course the lightweight syntax of python too you're going to find the ideal what would be the ideal programming language i don't know if like nim i checked that language out a year or two ago i don't remember if it kind of hit any of those nails on the head or not but i don't know one of these days somebody will backslid towards simula da 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 and so that person writes again what does object oriented programming mean to you no tutorial like introduction is needed just a short explanation explanation like programming with inheritance polymorphism encapsulation in terms of other concepts for a reader familiar with them if possible also it is not necessary to explain quote unquote object because i already have sources with your explanation of object from early history of small talk and then Ellen K writes, I'm not against types, but I don't know of any type systems that aren't a complete pain. So I still like dynamic typing. And I love that Ellen K says that, and I completely agree with him. And that's why I think TypeScript is bad, you know? But like he says, he's not totally against it. They kind of have their time and place, but um, really Java, pure JavaScript, if you're doing object-oriented programming right, which, 
the malleable forms, like especially JavaScript and Ruby, you can actually go in and wipe out the whole language and rebuild it yourself. So I think you could take the Ruby engine and a uh, very, very strict core, and you could rebuild the entire language uh, much more ideally off of itself with all the modern with modern Ruby. But uh, yeah, anyway, and just do dynamic typing and build a pure object oriented language like that. And think in terms of objects, I think it still should be called object oriented. But the thing is that a lot of people say object, they think object centric, you know, like class centric, modeling centric, or big upfront design centric, or something ridiculous like that. It's the message passing thing that's centric the interfaces the that type of a thing that's what centric it should be on um and then it's object oriented you know of course it's it's central things or messages around the objects to me means only messaging local retention and protection and hiding of state process and extreme late binding of all things. It can be done in small talk and in Lisp. There are possibly other systems in which this is possible, but I'm not aware of them. Uh, this was 2003, remember. So, means only messaging, which is what we talked about, the high, low, whatever you want to think of it about messaging. So that would be your built-in method calls, excuse me, that would be your JSON, RESTful, API calls, everything in between. Local retention. This is something I went ahead and looked up with the Stack Overflow answer. Is this the right one? I guess I closed that one out. But it, anyway, it was just like one single answer. And I just wanted to see if like what I was thinking about it. Local retention would be probably the best guess that is not disputed is that it means retaining the data or information or whatever you want to think of it as within the object itself. But I'm going to spin and expand on that and say that local retention means that that data is retained within, you know, behind that wall, that cell wall or that server wall or whatever you want to think of, of that object, so to speak. Um, but you don't know how that's implemented. You don't know, like when you make that JSON call, that RESTful call, you don't know if the database is literally on the same physical server or if it is on uh, another server behind that wall. You know what I mean? But it's sort of back there. So I don't think L and K, anything that I've seen by him, like I think there still are some loose ends like this that need to be tightened up. And that's where I feel like one of those things where it's like, I'm not trying to say like that I'm any kind of genius or, you know, any brighter than anybody else. But I just, I feel like that's, let me know if you think otherwise, you know, but obviously we're not going to limit it to that because if we were to limit it to like, oh, it has to be within that physical low level object, you know, that memory object on that system in that thread or something like it just that doesn't make sense that, OK, well, then in that case, you cannot have a MySQL database or something on another physical server like that's not allowed. You've just broken. And some people will pit that. Argue. I'm not. I say that very lightly because I've known, I've argued 150 comments before with people on those types of subjects on uh, social media stuff. They just won't give up. They just want to hang on to 50 year old stuff. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of good points in that stuff, but we got to just, we got to think progressive and think of those. We're trying to simplify things. We're not trying to overcomplicate them. So anyway, if you just sort of refine the idea of local retention, you know, I think if I, had a, net, a con maybe I should look him up and send him a message and see if he'll respond on some of this stuff for with L and K. So means only messaging. It means that that data is encapsulated, and that's where it goes on to say protection and hiding of state process. So all these things are really kind of the same thing. This is all just to say it's encapsulated, right there. You could just replace that with that and extreme late binding of all things. And this is to say dynamic, um, like I talked about that singleton, the late instantiation, you know, you can do it earlier, but to have the ability to dynamically bind it later 
is key. It can be done in those. Um, also, one of the things I should have mentioned is that there were two main paths that were catalyzed by uh, Simula. The early one, just by accident, was the BioNet non-data procedure route that I took. So that, again, that's that Oops Look uh, convention. I think you might have talked about it a couple other times too with public talks, but the BioNet thing he's talking about is that the biological cell as, you know, like think of a single cell. Um, and then the net is basically saying the server out there on the internet that, you know, it has its own process that you can you can only see its public interface to um, non-data procedure route so that's what I say and you know there's that membrane where you can only go by behavior and message passing and stuff like that you cannot go by uh, passing it bags of data even though so many systems are designed around that or have hybrid systems that are heavily based on that that is so bad you should really avoid that to a lot of degrees the other one which came a little later as an object of study was abstract data types and this got much more play okay so i was wrong i said the abstract data types were the very first thing so obviously there's messages and then the abstract data type thing more if we look at the whole history we see that the proto object oriented programming stuff started with abstract data types had a little fork towards what i call objects that led small talk, etc. But after the little fork, the CS establishment pretty much did ADT and wanted to stick with the data procedure paradigm. So I would say that like C programming probably, you know, might be an okay example of that, or maybe even more so like Pascal, like especially object Pascal kind of stuff, um, where you know, it wasn't you weren't thinking of data types as like necessarily by bytes I don't know that's arguable it's debatable on so many levels but then you end up with the data procedure paradigm like in the C programming language you had structs you know if you wanted to do an object with behaviors you'd have to use function pointers whatever which was just basically taking one of those properties on that structure which is like an object that doesn't have methods and so for one of those properties on that object you just have it point to a method and say, hey, I'm a method, like that kind of a thing. Historically, it's worth looking at the USA, da, 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 um, okay, in which he advocated embedding procedure pointers and data structures, which is exactly what I was just talking about. So that's like the evolution of that. Um, same offset in its data structure meant display and there would be a pointer to the appropriate routine so that kind of shows like the idea of a dynamic pointer to where you and i use that term loosely or whatever but to where you say like okay at whatever location in there if you go you know in a slightly high level implementation it would you would just call it dot display right but in low level terms that might be at address like 3303 or something and it goes there and it could be a different it could one might be print to the console another one might be print to a message box graphical user interface whatever you could dynamically swap that out but no matter what you know that if you go to that particular location then you're going to get that so if you in other words if you call a display function um the burrows b5000 whose program reference tables were true big objects he calls them i sometimes when i'm talking about them since you could uh refer confuse an object with like a memory object right i'll just say like uppercase or capitalized objects like capital o kind of objects um contained in pointers both data and procedures so that's where you're getting that idea of like instead of having to do this quote unquote function pointer which sounds scary to like entry-level programmers right you just say hey it's got you know if you add those parentheses instead of just a property name then it will actually call something instead of just immediately return a value but could often do the right thing if it was trying to go after data and found a procedure pointer um, so that's important right there it contained pointers to data and procedures but it could do the right thing if it went after data and found a procedure pointer so let's say you don't put those parentheses after I think this is something that some of these languages are javascript has added this in more recent years i think and python has it as well where you can and it's nice because it's easier to start out and just define a property like uh 
my color, I'm just going to say my color is blue. You know, I'm just going to say object, you know, obj dot color equals quote unquote blue or something. And so when you want to know my color, you just say, hey, object dot blue. And then you say if ob obj dot blue or excuse me, obj dot color equals blue, then print I am blue else print I'm some other color or whatever, you know. Well, then later on, you decide, you know what, that was easier and more agile or whatever you want to think of it as in the beginning, following that KISS principle of keep it short and simple. What's the simplest thing I can do to make this happen? Well, then later on, you might have to go back and do a lot of refactoring if you're like, okay, you know what, I really should have encapsulated that. Now I want to check and make sure, you know, what if they ask me for blue with an uppercase B or something and, you know, I had it implemented as blue with a lowercase B in that string um you know stuff like that and you're like well if i pit if i actually encapsulate that and pit that you know put those those braces around it and make it a function call instead of just a simple property then i could tell it to lower if to lower blue then da 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 then return blue or whatever you know like then set it as blue whatever you want to think of that as i think you do, maybe you should know where i'm going with that um but like I said, that'd be a lot of refactoring, right? Well, what this insinuates right here is that if you go after that data, but then you, it turns out you're like, oh, in hindsight, you turn it into a procedure, then it knows, hey, this is a procedure. So go, instead of just looking for that immediate kind of a value, go ahead and execute this procedure. Call, you know, run this and then take whatever return result value it gives you. So that's where I think that's going. And the very first problems I solved with my early Utah stuff was the disappearing of data using only methods and objects. Only methods, so we don't you don't see stuff about properties. You know, of course there's internal properties most likely, but, um, and that's key too because like, even if you, like my argument in pure object-oriented programming is that say you want something to string or as a string, right? Then, and a lot of this, the reason we don't do it this way is because back in the olden days, and even to this day, it's still heavily preached for the most part, as far as I know, is that, you know, if you want a string, you just set a string literal, right? You don't create a heavyweight, a so-called like capital big object, heavyweight string object, you know, you just do a string literal. And then if you end up needing to use that as a heavyweight object then you do take advantage of like auto boxing or whatever and you do that and it turns it fairly quickly behind the scenes it turns it into a heavyweight object does whatever to it and you know you do it like that but ideally you just want to keep it simple and keep it that string literal array literal object literal whatever you want to think of those things as oh my mind just went <laughs> blank on me right there but okay, so in modern times, now we have to assume, we should start assuming, and maybe not, I don't mean, I use that term loosely, right? Never assume anything, but um, it would be nice if we could start presuming that these compilers and runtimes engines for Java and JavaScript and all that are very efficient at handling objects. You know, we're getting into the day and age when systems are having very high speed, very huge amounts of memory, you know, not that that's always the case, but also that these runtime engines are getting better and better optimized. So it's time for those systems. I think we're at a point where these systems can be refined instead of focusing on extending the language and adding all these stupid features every single year to these languages. Now we need to focus more on the back ends of, ref you know, stop adding crap to these languages. They were finished a long time ago for the most part here and there, there may be a few things, but those really need to be decided upon. Um, but make the languages efficient behind the scenes at doing what they're originally meant to do. It's time to move away from primitives and towards pure objects. So everything's an object. You know what I mean? Python's done this under the seams, like, which is pretty trippy because on the surface, I don't think it is quite as purely object oriented, especially as um, in a lot of ways as like JavaScript and Ruby. But underneath it, like, and Ruby, you know, both JavaScript and Ruby do have a lot of overlap and they are very pure object oriented, but Python 2 and Ruby 2 
maybe JavaScript, I can't remember right now, but you can take like a number and call methods on like an integer. You can just wrap it in parentheses and do a dot, whatever, and call methods on them, right? That's what I'm talking about. Like everything should be an object. There should be none of this like floating function stuff where you're like, Python, it's kind of bizarre. I think they just did it to kind of like have a lot of overlap with backward compatibility and they're kind of stuck in some ways on some stuff. But like the length function, there's this len function. You just, if you want to know like the length of a string, you just call len and put the string in parentheses. But that really, and maybe they do have it also as a method. But really, in a pure object oriented system, everything should be methods. There should not be floating function, global functions out there that. It's like, oh, is this a function or is this a method? I can't remember. It's like, that should be a method and it should be whatever. I don't want to get too crazy off on that track right now, but that that's the key takeaway on that. Um, at the end of the 60s, I think Bob Balzer wrote a pretty nifty paper called Data, Dataless Programming. And shortly thereafter, John Reynolds wrote an equally nifty paper, Gedanken in 1970, I think, which showed that using Lambda expressions the right way would allow data to be abstracted by procedures. And at first I was like, huh, and I was trying to like wrap my mind around that, what that might have meant. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, I think I see. Like, especially in Python, if you think of a Lambda expression, you have like Lambda, Lambda, and then take a parameter like X, and then I can say, um, well, let me see here. I should just call it like, I'll say func equals lambda x, and then it's going to return x. So it, in this one regard, Python has a little touch of Ruby that sort of just return that expression, right? You don't have to use the word return. So this is just, a lambda is just a function expression, basically, and for the most part in a lot of these programming languages. So this is basically just a function that's going to take a variable, and then it's just featureless. It's just going to return that, that same exact value you give it. I assigned that to this particular identifier, that name, that variable. So if I call func, you can see it's a function. It's a lambda function. So if I say func and I pass it a three, I should get a three right back. And there it is, it returned a three right back. And uh, so by doing that, I'm kind of, I feel like to some degree, if you do that just right, then you can say, um, you can use that to get, now that I'm looking at it, I'm thinking about it a little bit different. I didn't go over and test it back then. But you can get that value right back, right? But if you want to do further uh, further thing, like you could do func equals lamb, lambda, huh, it, I didn't think about how that might be a little bit more complex example than what I was thinking. So func equals lambda, Oh man, my mind's crossing between JavaScript, like how I could do this kind of better in JavaScript, but I was so stuck on the Python way that now I'm thinking this. But anyway, I could do some kind of functionality right here and I'm getting tired as you are, if you're still hanging there, I appreciate it. Uh, to where I could just assign a simple value, like if I pass it func3, then if this was within an object, then it would say like, you know, some OBJ self in Python, it would be more like a self, right? Then it would say like self something, like self prop uh, gets X equals X. I mean, this isn't, this isn't proper right here. I'm just trying to be illustrative, just using this text right here, sort of making up a spin off of Python or something. Um, so you do that initially, right? And that is something to that effect of like, if this was within like a class object or something like that, I'm tired, I'm sorry. And then later on, if I wanted to go back and be like, you know what, I didn't want to just simply assign that. And then you could also say like, you know, once again, just making up the language here, if I was like, you know, if not X, like if they didn't pass in the X value, you know, like if X, compares to undefined if it was in Java or something, you know, then uh, we return 
uh, self dot x or so I don't know sorry I should have I was telling myself to like come over and practice that example but the, I, maybe you get the idea there that like something along those lines is what I think was going on with this doing the lambdas the right way I'll have to hash that one out and get a better explanation on it the people who liked objects as non-data smaller number including myself Pretty much all this group are from ARPA community involved in one way or another with the design of ARPANET, which became the internet basic unit of compilation, was a whole computer. So that's kind of like that cell or basic unit of computation, excuse me. But just to show how stubbornly an idea can hang on, all through the 70s and 80s, there were many people who tried to get by with remote procedure call, which is that CORBA and all that stuff that's very rarely used anymore, except in legacy code, you know. Now it's all the mostly restful APIs and stuff which you could still do authentication or whatever you need to on instead of thinking about objects and messages <laughs> excuse me all right um, message passing is more important than objects and uh, themselves were overemphasized the live distributed object programming model builds upon the observation it uses I don't think objects were overemphasized I think that excuse me sorry pumping the microphone um the that those pillars of object-oriented programming and the implementations that were less than ideal at the time i think that that was overemphasized the live distributed object model builds upon this observation uses the concept of distributed data flow to characterize the behavior of complex distributed systems turn message patterns using high level function Functional style specifications. Hmm. One then wonders why he called it object oriented rather than message oriented. It is object oriented. You just, people just don't understand because there's too much primitives used still. Just because then that was an optimization. So any optimizational stuff doesn't lend itself to being high level. Usually optimizations, um, speed, resource optimization wise, are going to lean towards going back to that more imperative style of programming. Even though there is imperative programming in object oriented programming, but ideally you've stuffed that over in a corner inside of an object. We didn't even do all this idea. I don't know how much more of this is really relevant. Okay, this is that human computer. One of the major points that I picked up from the following works, Alan K and others such as Jim Copelian, is that true object-oriented programming is about modeling computers and software in terms of human user mental models rather than being a tool for programmers. So, you know, that's where I was talking about, like, how JavaScript can take any type of number for the most part and figure out what you want to do with it. Python can take really huge numbers. That's coming from the human user when I think you should think of ideally of objects and object oriented design as real world. A lot of people say, oh, it's not really real world. That's where everything screws up. It is, it's exactly real world. But the thing is, don't try and model the whole world just that's where that big upfront modeling uml junk is just gonna drive you nuts don't do that because you don't know when to stop right so what you do is you think of it as the real world but only you know model it through the code as you type as a little simple monolithic procedure and then factor things out as they be as stuff starts building up in complexity taking up more than a screen full all those simple little things start pushing them out to functions and methods or whatever and then go that route and model just enough of that real world as you need you know and if you got to kind of deviate from the real world that's fine of course you know there's more of the conceptual world too that's part of your real world because human user mental models you know the world you could argue the world's an illusion whatever you want um you know we think that the glass with the pins on the table or whatever's there and whatever ideas we have about it but ultimately you know is the rim of that cup is that a true circle it's not you know it's not a perfect circle right so we're thinking of all those things it, it ultimately comes back to our concept our conceptual idea of it but we're trying to be concrete we're trying to have those concrete thoughts <laughs> 
So that's another one of those striving things to think about. But don't think about, you know, that you're not allowed to model on the real world. I've been able to debunk that every single time and I've I've thrown that against the wall with a lot of stuff I've seen, even from very people that I highly respect, like Robert Martin, um, Uncle Bob Martin, they call him, right? People like that, you know, they're, nobody's perfect. None of those, even those guys that just have it 90, 95% of the time are just spot on with every little engineering detail, every design detail that they tell you. You could just write every word down and have like the ideal book, but there's those few things, you know, um, for instance, one of the only other things I can think of off the top of my head are the zillion things that I agree with Bob Martin on in that, in those regards is that he considers chaining objects to be the, instead of the chain pattern, he calls it, I guess the train wreck pattern because of a debugging thing. But I have a whole argument against that too. I think object chaining, which if you dig through these object oriented design books, like especially in JavaScript where it definitely could apply, there's like one page. I just bought an old uh, JavaScript patterns book from around 2010 or something. And it talks about chaining. It's cool, but it's like literally one page and it just, and it even, I think mentions that Bob Martin argument about it. And it's like, whoa, this, that's like one of the most important patterns there is, especially when you get into like asynchronous programming and stuff like that. And it's just totally glossed over. Um, as I understand it, Ellen's vision of object oriented programming was making the computer a tool that allows human user to make whatever they want. The full capabilities of the computer are directly exposed to the end user through intuitive interactive model. I should be able to view and sculpt runtime objects and interactions directly, not just through code. That's cool. That's like a system to build a system. Small talk kind of reflects some of that idea. Um, that's a very good point. Here is a, which is yet to be realized on so many levels. Here's a post about my plans to attempt a, some version of this in JavaScript as a proof of concept. Oh, that's cool. I never checked that out. Um, from a perspective of software development programming, Jim Copeland talks about how code can and should resemble the user's mental model of it. That is, the code reads much the same way as it would sound by a person describing its behavior, which is, again, confirming that whole idea of like a, the user's own mental model, which is, I think most of us base our mental models primarily on the real world or our conception of it. Jim Copeland is a double-edged sword. Be careful with this guy. Um, for the most part, everything he did last century in like the 80s and 90s, spot on, unbelievable, just major uh, essential contributor to object-oriented programming and design, right? In this century, I feel like I, I got into him in the reverse order. I had only heard of him in this century, like his talks and stuff like that, and I couldn't disagree with anything he says more in this century like i i can't believe it you know i guess he just gotten too much in the thick of it or i'm just not understanding him i don't know um i just completely disagree with him but you go back like i said 80s and 90s spot on is is anything that i've seen it's such a trip it's black and white with him that is the code reads much the same way as it would by uh sound by a person describing its behavior, this is largely accomplished by thinking in terms of objects rather than in terms of classes and types. That's key. I think, you know, that ideally I would think would be a takeaway of what I've been talking about. Maybe I haven't quite said it that concrete, but classes and types are pretty much synonymous. You know, a lot of times when we think of types, we think of like low level primitive types, but a class is a type. And especially if you're, you know, like think of type defs or like creating your own class in an object oriented you're creating a type and using it as a type, they're synonymous. But objects are actually instantiations, are actually, you know, then you start thinking about the behaviors maybe a little bit more. It leaves something to be interpreted with that type of a statement, but that's definitely pointing you more in the right direction of don't, this is static. You know, objects ideally are dynamic. You know, you don't have const objects, sorry. You just don't. You don't, That that's wrong. If you are worried about whether or not a property changes, that needs to be added to the behavior of the method. You know what I mean? 
that shouldn't be some qualifier that goes before the object that the ver keyword should have been fine that should have been the be all end all python got it even better in that regard because they don't even have a keyword in front of when you create the uh you know the identifier name it you just say my object equals object you know you don't even have to use the new keyword which is another thing they got right for the most part i believe so anyway behavior is described on terms of the roles played by the objects not as part of the definition of an object's identity so uh yeah roles i think roles are somewhat synonymous with responsibility and definition of an object's identity i don't quite know exactly what they mean by that there i mean obviously identity just means it's unique it has like a unique location in memory or something on a more low level aspect as part of the definition and then maybe like a type maybe they're talking about I don't know uh, you should be able to model interactions on terms of objects which are identified by the role they play in an interaction so you can probably replace role with responsibility there too by the responsibility they play in an interaction this is how human mental models work waiter customer cashier source destination da, da, da. these are roles not types and you want to be able to define methods for whatever and of course like some systems you're in like if you're programming in java you're obviously going to have to define that most likely as a class or some type of type right so yeah you might have to do that in whatever box you're in or something so don't feel too bad if you're stuck in that kind of a scenario dealing with like these legacy languages and stuff but uh just try and you know you can call that type uh maybe it's ideal to call it a waiter to begin with don't feel like you have to create well a waiter's a person so i better create a person then well a person is um you know then there's two types of people there's male and female so i better create subtypes of persons male and female and then oh then you end up with that whole thing of like well do, is a waiter you know can a waiter be male or female? Just all sorts of stupid stuff you shouldn't even be having to wrap your head around. Refactor back to that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? You just have a waiter. You don't care if they're human. It could be a robot waiter. Who knows? You know, like tomorrow, whatever stuff's going to be. So to assume that a waiter is a human, don't do that unless it's absolutely necessary to save yourself from code duplication and to keep things simple. And you want to be able to define the methods for whatever object is playing this role at that time. Uh, because the behavior is part of a system interaction between many changing objects rather than part of the definition of some type. All right, done with that. What what tabs are we going to knock out before we pass out? That's it. That's it. Check out Yegor's stuff. Take it for a grain of salt. Whatever. Thanks for watching. Take it easy.